Welcome, everybody. This is the John Hallett Podcast, and with me today is Tony Morrison. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, man. Doing pretty good today. Can't complain. Good. Awesome. Um, awesome to get you on the show. We've known each other for a long time. It's yes. great to always connect with you. I think you're one of the classiest guys in the Krav Maga Alliance. <laughs> I appreciate your kind words. I appreciate it. I always enjoy training with you and speaking with you. So pre- pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Well, can you tell uh, all our listeners just a little bit about you? Okay. Well, um, I am the uh, Deputy Chief Instructor of the Krav Maga Alliance. Uh, I'm a fourth degree black belt in Krav Maga, training under uh, John Whitman. Um, been doing martial arts for a very, very long time. Um, I have black belts in other uh, other disciplines as well, but Krav Maga now uh, in the last uh, several years have been what I've been really focused on because um, I, I that's what I gravitated to more of the self defense aspect of of training, um, and I just I just like that type of training. So um, that's basically what it is. I'm from uh, Brooklyn, New York. Still live in Brooklyn, New York. I love it, but uh, I get a chance to travel, so that's a good thing. Yeah. Did you grow up in Brooklyn too? Yeah, I grew up in Brooklyn. I was actually I was actually born I was born in uh, Jamaica, the West Indies, and came here with my uh, immigrant parents when I was five years old. So uh, I uh, I spent a little time in Jamaica that I don't really remember that much because I was so young. And then I from five years old until now I've been pretty much in and on Brooklyn, New York. No, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you enjoy it? I love it. I'm a, I'm definitely a Brooklyn kid. I love I love Brooklyn. I'm only about 15 minutes from New York City, and I go into the city often. But um, Brooklyn is where it's at. It's really hip. It's nice. Uh, a good diversity of people. Um, people, you know, although New Yorkers get a bad a bad rap, there's a, a bunch of really nice people around, and uh, it, it's just a cool place to be. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I grew up. Outside of Boston, Massachusetts, so you know we were bred to hate anybody in New York. You know, you know oh, this I didn't know you were from Boston. I didn't. I didn't know you were from Boston because um, I, I I basically lived. I um, lived a, a lot in Boston. I, I traveled to Boston for like about ten years. Every weekend from um, from Thursday to Monday, I was there every weekend for ten years. Um, oh yeah. So, yeah, so uh, my, my my New York friends are pissed at me because my team used to be the the Patriots. You know, I, I'm a Tom Brady. Fan. <laughs> so, but uh, but uh, a lot of my friends when we used to travel to Boston for karate tournaments, I was a big time c- competitor in karate tournaments. We used to have a, a good rivalry with the Boston boys. You know, it was yeah, the New York yeah. the Boston boys. So it was all right. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I grew up. I wasn't too far or away from uh, Paul Garcia's. School. Okay. Yeah, I've known Paul for a very long time. Uh, him and I used to fight each other uh, when we were younger, um, and then um, and then you know as the years became you know went by, he became uh, very instrumental in helping people really get their studios together and run it professionally and become successful enough to uh, take care of their families and learn how to run their schools like a business. So yeah, he's very big on that right now. And we're still good friends. Um, and he's still a part of the Krav Maga Alliance. And uh, I train him and his, um, his, his black belts. So we still have a good friendship. Yeah. He's a great guy. Yeah. That's awesome. One thing. I wish I was when I, you know, coming up through and becoming a school owner that I kind of took a little bit more seriously. I would say like kind of the first 10 years I was so um, caught up in Krav Maga and just, getting better and doing stuff that was all just about getting better as a practitioner, (laughs) you know, and it was lucky, you know, I was able to survive and, you know, provide for my family and everything doing that. But, you know, about 10, 12 years ago, I'm like, man, I think I need to get really more serious on this business side. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I know. Like, you know, as a, as the, as a martial artist, we tend to focus on that part, right? We want to be good at what we do. We want to make sure that we're, we're, we're legit when people won't look at us, do martial arts and stuff. They, we want them, we want them to look at us and say, wow, that guy really knows what he's doing. But um, yeah, lots of us, we didn't, we didn't focus on the business part, you know? So (laughs) when when, when the bills start coming, we like, we realize, okay, we got to start focusing on both. Um, And then you get, you you know, you get that fine balance. So it's, it's there now. So that's cool. Yeah. So um, you've been doing martial arts for a long time. How did you find martial arts? Um, Okay, so basically, uh, I was six years old, and my uncle um, 
my uncle had the, the privilege of being a babysitter for me and my two cousins, and he was taking karate lessons. So while he was babysitting us one day, he decided, oh, listen, I'm going to go to karate. You guys could come and you guys could sit and wait and watch us, watch us, you know, watch me take my class. So he took me, took us to the karate class and me and my two cousins, we sat there and we watched him in class and like typical kids after class, we started kicking and punching at each other and fighting around thinking like, you know, we were, we were like the next Bruce Lee's or whatever. We, we were trying to mimic what we saw them doing on the floor. So my uncle came up to us and he said, Hey, you guys, you guys want to learn karate? And we said, yeah, yeah. You know, we were all jazzed and we were like, yeah, we want to learn karate. And he says, well, listen, this is very serious stuff. You gotta, you gotta be focused and you gotta do it seriously. And if you're going to do it, you know, you got to eat, drink and sleep karate. You got to be really good at it. So I took that to heart. So I was like, yeah. So my uncle signed us up at six years old. And at the time uh, when my uncle signed us up, there weren't a lot of kids taking uh, karate classes. It was just me and my, in, in the class that I went, it was me, my two cousins, and maybe four or five other kids. There weren't a lot of kids involved. It's just, this was pre-Karate Kid and Ninja Turtles. This is all, you know, pre all of that stuff. So most of yeah. the people who were in class were teenagers and adults. So we took classes with, the, they didn't have any separation of, you know, adult classes, children classes. We took classes with, with their teenagers, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. So we were on the floor with teenagers. Um, it was, I started with uh, Japanese Shotokan karate. Um, so uh, that's how we got started. And I just, uh, I, I loved it. So I never stopped. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's young pre karate kid. You're dating yourself. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm uh, pretty old right now. Uh, in my mind, I'm still the same, but in my, you know, my body reminds me often that I'm not the same. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's always the mind, though. That's why I tell people, I'm like, oh, you're only old if you think you're old. You know? That's right. That's right. But yeah. Still going to train smart, but don't get this old mentality in your head. And like, absolutely. That's the point. Yeah, that's, that's the point. point. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I didn't realize you started at six years old. That's fantastic. Yeah, I started, uh, started at six years old. By the time I was, uh, I think, nine, nine years old, we were junior black belts. Um, and, uh, we just, I just kept going. Uh, I just kept, uh, still doing martial arts. And then basically what kept me in martial arts was, uh, I got to compete in karate tournaments and started loving that. I love the competition. Um, and, uh, it was like a good rivalry. It was always, it was, you know, back in the day when you went to karate tournament, it was like, you know, you're, you went there with your, with your school, your clan of people versus all the guys and stuff like that. So it was good rivalry. I had some, uh, some, some good friends that we used to fight each other hard, but we had good respect for each other. So it was nice. Yeah. Now you do any other sports growing up or you just really stick with karate? Um, no, you know, when I was in, when I was in, um, when I was in junior high school and high school, uh, my mom took me actually to the YMCA and I started doing gymnastics and I did gymnastics for a long time. I did the gymnastics in high school and then I was able to go to a gymnastics team in, um, in Staten Island. Um, and I was on a private gymnastics team. So I competed in gymnastics. I thought that gymnastics would enhance my, my karate ability. And I think it did. It gave me a good knowledge of my body and also, um, stretching and, and, and flexibility was a big part of gymnastics. So I think that helped me with maintaining flexibility. So I had, so I, it enhanced my kicking and moving drill. Uh, ability. So um, I did that. And then, you know, just the regular things around the, the neighborhood, played basketball at the park and softball with my friends. But uh, mostly I focused on just doing karate. I was, I was the guy in the neighborhood, everybody made fun of So, Oh yeah, there's, there's that karate kid, you know, cause yeah. all I, all, every time they saw me, I was on my way to karate school. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah, my friends used to tease me like, Oh, they used to call me like karate boy or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. Oh gosh. I used to get made fun of all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like God, I didn't start until I was 19 years old and okay. the Taekwondo class um, was in the local health club on Nantucket Island. So it was small. So we'd be out there in our dobok, like waiting for class and you're like, <laughs> right. And right. You walk by. The guys would make fun of me all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got made fun of all the time. Cause I, I also went to Catholic school. So I had a Catholic school uniform and then I had my karate uniform. <laughs> so it just, uh, it was just, you know, it's funny because now um, kids being teased and picked on a lot. 
is we, you know, we, we say we have this big bullying situation in school, but that was, that was kind of my life. You know, that's what it is. They make fun of us because we're to Catholic school and they, yeah. you know, they, they made jokes about us and they picked us. And, uh, and then they did the same thing when they saw me getting ready to go to karate school. It was, uh, it was funny, but uh, you know, it was all right. It's just, you know, how kids are. They make yeah. fun of each other. It's all good. It's all I know. Good. Yeah. You're fun. like, is it, is it friend razzing? Or are you really getting bullied? Because right. You know, yeah. I, you know, growing up on Nantucket, sometimes people don't realize how diverse it is and how so many, there's so many people from so many places there that I'm like, sometimes I was the only white kid in the group of friends and they would all right. rise me in all good nature. And you're like, right. you just gotta it's, handle it, right? it's just everybody. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we do. Right? No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, growing up. Yeah, it was fun. And I think nice. So nice. You know, you never know what bullying is these days. You don't want to take it all serious. Yeah, there's a very fine line, right? There's a very fine line between what is, what is bullying and, and what is just like, hey, kids just making fun of each other. And that's how, you know, even now, I'm, I, I, as I'm an, as an adult, I have friends that, you know, when we see each other, the first thing we do is insult each other. But it's it, we know it's coming from a place of, of love, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the minute we see each other, we don't usually say hello. We go, hey, stupid or something like that. And it's like, oh, you know, it's like the way we that's the way we greet each other. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. Fun. It's kind of. Yeah. When I was watching on like us older guys this past weekend at the Krav Maga Alliance. Um, <laughs> trial by fire and i'm like we're doing all this running and moving and i was like look at this old guys john tony i'm like we're doing this with walkers we get like we that's right <laughs> yeah we had a lot of fun it was uh it was a nice it was a good weekend i, I enjoyed it enjoyed it yeah really john nice. always is such a fantastic guy so yeah he put together good things and uh, uh and uh it's good it's good and i'm glad to see I, I'm, I was glad to see you and a couple of other people that were there because we haven't seen each other in such a long time yeah it's been a while and, you know post covid everybody was on lockdown so that even you know dulled everything even even now um in, in just my social life uh i used to have lots of people come by my house pretty much like every weekend my house is kind of like the house we get together and have drinks and and have conversations and stuff but uh post-covid people are still kind of like everybody still scattered all over the place doing their own thing so it's even harder so when we yeah. get a bunch of people together and it was a it was a good group i, th- I think it was perfect for the first one back post-covid because we didn't have so many people but we had a good group of people so we we uh we were able to um have that good energy but not so many people that it would be overwhelming yeah yeah, yeah. i definitely like that the connection i'm not very good on the phone and yeah email and stuff i'm like right right right, right. exactly right <laughs> so much thank god for zoom <laughs> yeah thank goodness yeah you can at least see the person that's so. it well, how has martial arts impacted your life? What do you think the biggest thing that martial arts has done for you? You know, um, the biggest thing I think that martial arts has done for me was it gave me the ability to travel, um, travel the world and to see different people and to, uh, and, and to learn from different people. Um, because when I was growing up, I remember never having a desire like when you grow up in a certain area and you you have your friends there and you're you know everything that you do is pretty much within this square footage of a uh, square miles of, of where you live um you just think that that's the world you don't really think about everything else um so i never really had a desire but because i was in martial arts i was a uh, i was able to to travel right i remember going to you know london and germany and different places competing and then you know, you meet people from other cultures and you realize like, we're all the same, <laughs> you know, like we, we live in different places, but we all pretty much share the same thing. We either love martial arts or we're still, or we're all looking for the same things. We're looking for happiness. We're looking for um, safety. We're looking for, you know, um, compat- compatible, compatible people that have this similar interests. And that's when you meet people, it doesn't matter where you come from, you guys get together because you have those interests and so you just start learning so much more about people and it's better than you know reading in a book about this this person if you actually go and get on a plane and get off there you start to realize like oh wow these people are just like me um so it, it was awesome I, I got a chance to to travel to places I didn't think that I would ever 
uh, be able to travel to or even had the interest of travel to. But once I got the bug, once I was able to start traveling, then I started having the mindset of like, yeah, man, I want to go to more places. I want to visit more places and see more places. So um it started that in my mentality. And then also as I started teaching and was able to start traveling to teach other people, um, I still do that to this day. I travel with, you know, uh, teaching for the Krav Maga Alliance since we have an international organization um, and doing teaching and certifications and seminars all over the world. And um, I love that. I love that part of traveling. And that's what I don't think without martial arts, it probably would have happened maybe later on in life or maybe not at all. I don't know, but it definitely was the, the 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 vehicle that started my mentality of wanting to get outside of where just where I lived in New York and in, in, in you know Brooklyn because when I was younger you couldn't tell me there was anything going on any other places but Brooklyn New York that's where that's where it was all happening right I didn't care about anything else so yeah definitely helped me that way yeah that's great I and mean, when you get out there and see the world and realize people are so much more alike than these small little things and yeah. our culture is now with social media and it just segregates so many people. Yeah. 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 It's a completely different animal. You know, and people media. in person and you know, yes. so much more in common than the algorithm. Feeds <laughs> us. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's that's, so true. That's, that's, yeah. That's, that's always great of, you know, like this past weekend or just going and, and testing through the years in Krav Maga of meeting yeah. different people and, and different walks of life. It's always great. Yeah. You that's know. all, that's a great, that's a good plus. That's why I try to participate in everything that we have. Um, Cause that's, I always meet some people, you know, and, and I've, I, I always meet someone who's interesting and, and you could always talk to them and, and just get to know people from all over. And then, you know, now because of social media, you're able to keep in touch a little bit more. You can get on Facebook and say hello to them. You know, if it's a, a birthday might pop up and you can say happy birthday, man. And they'll remember you and, you know, and, and it's good like that. And, and then it's also good for, you know, if somebody needs a, to answer a question, if they have a, a question that they might want to ask, they could always, you know, ask the person and we can help each other and network that way so it's good yeah it's great that way well what is your biggest struggle as a martial artist what is you know i think people starting off always kind of have this you know i'm slow i just had a guy just the other day um i don't want to slow down the class and I'm like everybody's a beginner right. um, everybody we're in our gym everybody's here to help you so that guy you know, somebody slow down a little bit. They're training, you know, a time or two to get you better. That's our community here. We want to help people get better. We all have struggles. What what has, you know, been your hardest thing as a, mar you know, to overcome as a martial artist? Um, you know, I would say that the biggest thing that I've gotten, that I've had to overcome in martial arts is, uh, believe it or not, is probably patience. And patience within myself, right? And, and what I mean by that is, as as a as that martial arts with that mentality of wanting to go, 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 and to be good and to always push yourself. Um, I think er, in the earlier years, I wasn't patient enough with myself, so um, I didn't take care of myself. It, it, if I if I got injured, I wasn't patient enough to wait for myself to heal correctly without jumping back out there. And as I got older, um, I start to realize that I have to I have to learn how to be patient. And sometimes I, I, I had to learn that sometimes inactivity is an activity, right? Because as as the, as the martial arts who's so gun ho, we think that we always got to be working at it. And if we miss a day, like oh my god, I'm going to fall behind, and you know I'm 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 not up to the task. Um, and the reality of it is I am up to the task. I'm just injured or maybe I'm just fatigued. You know, maybe I didn't get enough sleep a couple of nights and I'm fatigued. So I have to learn to listen to my body and be patient enough to know that sometimes taking some time off is not me slacking off. It's me listening to my body and, and doing what's necessary for me to, to, to come back stronger when I have more energy, because my body is going to, you know, is, is, is going to perform, but it's going to ask me to do certain things. And sometimes it's going to say to me, Hey man, you need to rest. 
And some days it's going to say, hey, you need to push harder. And the days where it says push harder, yeah, we, we all welcome that because we like, yeah, we want to feel like we, we, we kicked our, we got a killer workout. We feel good about it. We're sweating. We're breathing hard. And, and we love that feeling, right? Those endorphins are released in our bodies yeah. and we love that feeling. But sometimes the feeling of like, listen, man, today, I just want you to sit on your couch and do absolutely nothing because you're a little bit tired. You're a little bit injured. You know, you feel that little tweak in your hip. Maybe you need to rest today. You don't need to throw a hundred kicks today. You just need to relax. And um, so what was the hardest part is, is as a martial artist is sometimes being patient enough with myself to know that when it's time to take a, a, a little bit of a break, I, I should do that. Yeah, definitely. I, I always tell people, I'm like, I want to see you here, but don't overtrain. Don't overdo it. You're excited now. Right. It's not worth hurting yourself. Like, right, oh, right. So yeah. Easy. yeah. And even, hey, you're, you got that little tweak. I mean, the mental training and just visualization is mm -hmm. so key. I just do a ton of that. Right. Um, even all the time, I'm not hurt. I'm, you know, working my visualization, but I'm like, right. you're hurt is right. a perfect opportunity. Or I'm like, I tell people to come into class and watch, observe. Right. And they all tell, like, oh, I picked up so much. Or you're like, right. Just looking and listening, right? Yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah you it's a different perspective. It's yeah. great. Just well, that's be because we came from, I mean, uh, um, not to not to figure out how old you are, but I come from old school and, you know, the old school guys, they had they didn't have the technology that we, they have now. The studies that have been done on world class athletes that's available to us to understand that training you can train differently and become just as fast or just as strong with. Uh, with a specific type of training, as opposed to, you know, in my, in my karate school, I had old school karate instructor that was like, came from Vietnam, who was kind of like, you know, mean and scary. And it was all about training hard and punching the makiwara until your knuckles are bloody yeah. and all that stuff, <laughs> you know, and that, and that's what made you a strong and tough fighter, you know, knuckle push ups and all that stuff. And, um, they didn't, it, it was, for for lack of a better word, I would say it was kind of like Neanderthal type of training, and it, it worked for for that time. But it, but what we've known now with all the sports psychologists and and all the physiologists and stuff of like that who've come up with all these training programs for these world class athletes that we have now access to um, on our smartphones and our computers, we know that there's so many ways of training, uh, um, like you know. We, we never really spent a lot of time learning how to uh, visualize and do visualized training and, and, and to do meditation and stuff like that. Cause it was like, you know, strong Shotokan karate. You just go forward, 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 yeah. forward, forward, you know, but, but now all that stuff is available to us and, um, and we're smarter now. So we're training much smarter instead of training. Uh, we train hard all the time, but we also add that, that element of training smart. So this way, uh, we can continue to train. I, I hope that, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, uh, if I'm lucky, I hope I'm, be, I'm able to train as, long, as as much as I train now, well into my 70s and 80s, you know. So uh, I want to be like um, Helio Gracie. Helio Gracie was still rolling on the mat when he was 80 something years old. Yeah. You know? So you want to be that, you know, something that you love to do. But of course, you have to just uh, change your training as you get older. And um, and listen to your body and you'll be able to do it for a long period of time. Yeah, absolutely. See, if you would like to support the podcast, please check out our online store at clearsky-online.com. Get Krav Maga gear and nutrition. Nutrition is so important to fuel your workouts. What do I use? Check out the link in the description for my personal choices from test boost to the protein to BCAAs, check out Prestige Labs at clearsky-online.com. The holidays are upon us. If you need some more Rocky Mountain self-defense and fitness gear, check out our other show sponsor, kravmaga-online.com for all your Rocky Mountain self-defense and fitness gear. From gloves to t-shirts to pants to hoodies, We've got it all. If you need something not pictured on the store, let me know and we can order it for you for this holiday season. Again, check out kravmaga-online.com. 
um, you're so old, you forgot that I told you how old I was. Because you said, I can't have a big birthday. And I'm like, so did I. Oh, I right. like, okay. So we're both 60. You had a 50th birthday, Tony. You're like, no, 60. Yeah, like, 60, man. Yeah, I got the big six O, so it's all good. But I, you know, I feel great. And um, and I'm glad that I I, I uh you know, I'm glad that I started I started Krav Maga. I started Krav Maga, I guess, I guess most people started Krav Maga later too. So I like, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I do that. I, I, I haven't done like traditional karate in a long time. I still know how to do it, but I haven't really yeah. done it in a long time. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been doing Krav Maga? Oh my God. Well over, when did, when did I start? I think I started in 2000, I think in 2000. Okay. Uh, maybe like 20 years now. I started Krav Maga. I, I you know, I accidentally, um, I used to teach a I used to teach a cardio kickboxing class in a in a health club. So this uh, really big health club in New York City um, at the time, um, I was teaching a cardio kickboxing class, and uh, there was a guy taking my class one day, and I noticed that he had pretty good skill. His kicks and punches looked really sharp. So I knew that he trained in some type of martial arts. Most of the people who trained um, took my cardio kickboxing class were you know. Um, were women and they did it for fitness. They weren't karate people. They weren't martial artists. They just did it because it was, you know, the Taibo craze had already hit and everybody yeah. loved cardio kickboxing classes. So I, I had a pretty good kickboxing class. Turns out that the guy who was taking my class came up to me at the end of the class and said to me, Hey man, you know, this was a great class. I got a good workout. And I said, yeah, I also noticed that you had some pretty good skills. So you must take some martial arts. And he goes, yeah, I, I take Krav Maga. I never heard of it. I'm like, Krav Maga, what is, what is that? You know, cause I knew Taekwondo, I knew karate, jujitsu, yeah. you know, but I've never heard of it. And he goes, oh, it's this Israeli thing. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah, if you want to take a class, you know, there's a class on Sundays. Uh, if you want to meet up with me, I I'll take you as my guest and you can come and take a class. So I was like, all right. <laughs> so I met him and I took my first Krav Maga class. And after the first class, just the first class, I was like, oh my God. I got to do this. Right. It, it was, it was so, I felt it was so awesome. It was like, this is what I want to do. So, um, so I, I started taking Krav Maga and uh, the person who happens to be that person is, is a guy named uh, Alan Predlin. I got to give a shout out to my boy, Alan Predlin, who, oh, yeah. um, who's also, uh, who, who was, you know, responsible for getting me involved in Krav Maga. Um, really good guy. He's like, you know, I consider him my brother. And um, from there, I just kept training. And then Alan moved from New York. He moved to LA. And then he called me up and says, hey, you got to come out to LA and do some Krav Maga with these guys. So I jumped on a plane and went out there and, and started doing Krav Maga. And, and, I, and I, I never stopped. So, um, you know, now, 20 plus years later, um, you know, I'm a fourth degree black belt. I, I feel really good about it. And and I and I still love doing it, still love teaching it. So I hope I have a lot of years left to continue to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I found it on the that A&E special. Oh, right. <laughs> I remember that. And like, Kamaga was ranked, I don't know, seventh or ninth. And I was yeah. like, that's the most practical looking one right there. Right. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, to find out later um, from a story from John Whitman that they had just kind of showed up at a regular class and said, we're here to film. And they're like, we we're supposed to film on such and such a day and time. And they're like, well, we're here. We're here. We're we got to do it. <laughs> and I'm like, it was not a setup. Um, all black belts dressed as white or orange or whatever. Right, it was as whoever was in the class. It was a regular Krav Maga class. And I'm like that looks legit. I want to do that. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 I was, I was actually really floored when I did the same thing. I did the first class. So it was good. So uh, yeah, man, that's nice. nice. Yeah. I wish I took a class before I went to instructor training. I was, on, <laughs> I was, I was on Nantucket Island and I think there was one place. Um, I think it was Dennis Amato and his old partner up in Boston. Mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, maybe I'll go up there. And I just never did. Right. And I never found, I think the um, it was from the old Krav Maga Worldwide Northeast Regional Training Facility. The guy that I, you know, was, you know, onboarding me, I guess, on the Krav Maga. I was like, well, you should do this Boss Rutan workout. I never was able to find that on the internet back then. 
Oh, okay. You know, about the same time, 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't find this boss rooting workout. And then day three or four of the instructor training, you know, you're dead you're already. Dying, right. <laughs> oh, I tell my students, I'm like, so we did like two or three hours of Krav Maga, like a, a full on class. And then they put on boss rooting all of our workout. Right. That was my first, like, first exposure to that boss rooting workout, which I love and have done so many times over the years. But I'm yeah, like, I, I, I actually still do that workout. And, yeah. And, yeah. I actually still do. I, I even got to a point where I, um, I, I've got the original cassettes. Right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what, yeah, I've yeah, got them with yeah. cassettes, and yeah. what I did, uh, what I did, because one of my hobbies when I was um, when I was a teenager and stuff is I was a DJ. So what I did is I recorded music over Boss's voice, so I could have music because before it was just his voice, right? And after doing it for so many times, I was like, I used to hear Boss's voice in my sleep, and I'm like, I can't stand this anymore. I gotta get some music. <laughs> so I mixed, uh, I mixed all types of music over over the the, the boxing workout and the all around workout and the, all the you know the MMA workout that he had because he had like four or five different workouts. Um, so I, I put music together, but even to this day, I still do it because I it's a it's still a killer workout. Yeah, yeah it's still it is it's great. I still do it. I love it. I had done the same thing except I didn't have that. I had uh, was playing around a got a number of years ago now and was recording over it and I had I messed up the volume of boss to the audio to the music okay and I put it in I could hear boss just fine but my instructors or whoever I was doing it with potentially or if I just played it for a class they're like what's he saying I'm like I think right. I just my boss I don't even really need to hear him but his voice was so you low know what it is like, too. Yeah, the music's <laughs> it's good and I'm like I can hear those <laughs> I think what happened also, because that still happens to me too. I think what happens is we get used to boss's voice, right? Because yeah. I'm used to boss's voice, right? Um, so if you've never heard him before with that little, you know, that, that slight accent that he has, people are like, what did he say? Because my students still ask me that. So yeah. listen, just do whatever you think he said. Because <laughs> Yeah, I know. When in doubt, do push-ups. <laughs> yes. Like, if you're saying just doing push-ups, you're probably right. Like, <laughs> what's a punch combo is probably push-ups. <laughs> yeah gosh yeah. yeah that workout that is yeah it's got me through a lot of instructor training yeah, yeah that's a, when, yeah, years yeah, when definitely. i didn't have good training partners or right whatever i'm like what are you doing to get motivated and i used to right. do the 28 minute workout and you know uh, the tie boxing workout back to back and right and right ready for instructor training Right. Yeah. And that was a difficulty too, about when getting involved in Krav Maga, there was no, there was, uh, I, I met, I met Alan and then I met um, the other guy who was teaching here in New York, but there weren't a lot of uh, opportunities or people who knew Krav Maga on the East coast. So that's why when Alan left and went to, to the West coast, I flew to the West coast in order to learn. Um, and I did that. I, I still do that now for years. It's been, you know, lots of years and I still jump on a plane and go to train with John because there's not uh, a lot of people that still, you know, there's not a lot, a lot of instructors that are out there who teach Krav Maga on the East coast um, and other places around the country. It, it's difficult to find. And then when we start to get more and more advanced, it's difficult to, for us to find um, an instructor or people for us to train, you know, for, for myself. So I was, I was, I was lucky. I have a good, a couple of good students that I can still train with, but other than that, I supplement my training. I have a boxing coach that I go to every week. Um, and he puts me through boxing workouts and then I go to the gym and, and do certain things because I just don't have the, uh, the, the, the people at the level in order to train with, unless we go away for special weekends, like we did the past weekend. Yeah. And that, yeah, I was going to ask you what your, what your training is looking like, at age 60, I, we, we recorded Yeah, a at age 60, you know, um, I pretty much, uh, I, I, um, I, I work out every single day. Um, every single day I do, I got, I got the standard every single day that I do. I do, uh, I got a Peloton. I love it. I fell in love with Peloton. So I do my Peloton every day. Um, I walk on the treadmill um, for 30 minutes every single day. And then I do weights. 
every single day. So I go to the gym to do weights and cardio. And then I do, um, I do the boss tapes. I, and I still do, I have a boxing coach, like I said, um, and I go and do my boxing coach about once or twice a week. And then other than that, um, I get a, uh, one of my black belts from, uh, from one of the studios to come and we, and we do, um, um, uh, Thai style uh, pad work where we go back and forth with pad work um, so that I can have somebody who can actually hold pads for me. So that's what I do. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. And it's always trying to stay injury free. Yes. We get because yeah, those yeah. Don't do it well, like they I always do. tell students I never when I practice, especially when I do my Krav Maga now, I do Krav Maga at medium pace. I never do it fast. I I do every single technique at a medium speed. The only time I do Krav Maga techniques fast is when I'm demonstrating to my um is when I'm demonstrating to my students or when I'm training you know uh, advanced training with uh, with black belts at at at, at the at the little headquarters with with John or whatever. But other than that, um, I just do a medium pace so that my body will get acclimated to the movements and just kind of have that muscle memory. So once you do it like that, I always tell people when they're starting, just do slow to to fast. I don't I don't practice um anything fast at all until I have to demo. So when I have to demo, then I do it fast, right? Because I want to impress my students. I also want them to see like, hey, this is what you should look like after you've done it a couple of thousand times. Um, and, and this is how aggressive I want you to be. But when, I, when I'm practicing for myself, everything is at slow to medium pace. Yeah, I, I love doing that. Um, mm -hmm. That's something I've always kind of just try to get it down. That was kind of from my martial arts days of like, get right. the moves down instead of going too fast. I know you want to, sometimes if I have a group of students that have been around for a while, I'm like, I'm just going slow and smooth for you guys. I'm not going fast because you're going to try to go just as right. fast as I'm as going. As you do. Right. Like you can still be aggressive. Right. You can be deliberate. You can work your targeting. You're not going to injure your partner, but you're going to get it down. You can still yeah. do all everything Krav Maga. It doesn't have to be fast and you're not going to build in some little glitch into your technique that's wrong right. and yeah, yeah you absolutely realize you're doing it absolutely and i learned that um i learned that years ago when i was when i when i was in my teens i was uh i was at a karate tournament and one of the guys at the karate tournament was this phenomenal taekwondo um martial artist with phenomenal kicking skills his kicking skills were like lightning fast and precise and they were amazing. And his name is John Chung, very famous um, instructor. Um, and his instructor was Jun Ri. And okay. um, I watched him do a form and his kicks were amazing. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, John, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you get your kicks so quickly and so sharp and everything like that? And he said to me, he goes, Tony, I don't, I don't ever kick fast unless I'm competing or when I'm demonstrating. And I said, really? He goes, I do slow kicking. And, he, and I said, what is that? And he showed me some slow kicking drills that I still do to this day. And sometimes when I do sem seminars, I teach people how to do the slow kicking, um, lay down kicks on the ground and then slow kicking, standing up um, by yourself or with a partner and basically just kick slow and methodically. And that will develop all those muscles because a lot of times when we kick really fast, we kick, we flash through those muscles, right? And we use momentum. But when you start to kick really slow, you get, you feel every little muscle working and you start to shake and you get stronger. And now when it's time for you to kick fast, your kicks are so much more powerful and you have so much more control. So I learned that from, from John Chung, right? world champion, John Chung. Um, and I've done it. I, I still do slow kicking to this day and i apply that same methodology to uh, my krav maga i do my technique slow and and deliberate so that when i have to do it fast my brain doesn't have to think about it i have that unconscious competence right and it just moves really quickly yeah no i i feel the same way about that i'm like you know coming up in krav maga and we're just hitting pads and all that stuff and yeah <laughs> you know, midway, through, I'm like, God, the some of the stuff we were doing in martial arts, I'm seeing people have weaknesses here, like right. hiking in the air. Like, let's see if you can do it slow. That right. really does develop the person. And like you said, like work all those little muscles so you're not just yeah, like, you know, going through the motions. <laughs> you don't even realize what you're doing. If you can do it slow, you can do it fast. That, you can do it fast, easy. That's right. Yeah, yeah. slow, smooth, and smooth will equal fast. Absolutely. Yeah, you can do a kick slow and easy. Like I, my class today was doing some side kicks and 
rowing defense. I'm like, just go easy. They're trying to, of course, they started going fast and like, right, right. <laughs> kick down. It's not really looking like a sidekick anymore. The, right, so right. Easy. We're both getting some good practice here, but uh, it's, it's difficult. It's not easy. It's better to kind of go really fast and right. It, yeah. It, Cause everybody it, wants to be fast and aggressive, right? Cause that's the Krav Maga way, right? Everybody wants to be fast, strong and aggressive. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to, to rein them in and say, Hey, listen, just take it slow. You're going to be all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. There's so many things. It's just training's just endless. That's what I'm like. You can yeah. always get like, we can all get better as long as yeah. we can do it. I'm that's like, that's the key. The key is to always the the key is to always have a, a a very humble attitude and realize that regardless of how many years you've been doing it, you could still learn. Right? Um, I still go. I you know I have a boxing coach. When I get there, he tells me to warm up, and he goes, "All right, let me see you work on your jab." I don't say work on my jab. You know how many jabs I've thrown in my years? I don't say that. I just go there. And if he says, do a jab, then I just do a jab, man. And you know what? He might say one little word that make my jab a little bit better. I don't think that for me doing martial arts for so many years that I'm I'm incapable of learning or are incapable of making a mistake that I'm not seeing that someone else could help me on. So if you have that kind of mentality that you're always looking to learn and get better, um, you'll be a lifelong martial artist. And that's what you want to be. Yeah, that's that's my goal. I hope to be doing it. Yeah, no doubt. Right? As long as I can, it makes me feel great. Um, I yeah. feel so much better. I stopped for a bit um, in my twenties, okay, and you know, um, was building the house and was just totally consumed with physically building the house. Oh, okay. And, um, I realized I'm like, man, I just don't feel good. I'm a little more depressed, and just I'm like. I'm 20 something years old. I was really young. I was like 21, I think, when I built my house. Wow. And I, was like, I should be on the top of the world. I'm like, I, I have my own house. It's so lucky. I did it myself. Yeah. And I was like, what? What was missing? And I had found Taekwondo right after high school and, you know, playing high school sports. And I went, I felt so much better when I was doing Taekwondo. Like I, right, right. That was the key that was missing. Yeah. You know, it, I always tell people it's life changing. I felt great. And when I got, you know, back into it and I was like, okay, I feel good. You know, nice. like, that, you know, what's yeah. missing in my life or just finding that missing thing. Right. And yeah. No doubt. That's awesome. Awesome wow. to see when somebody finds that, you know, as instructors and they, you know, make it part of their lifestyle. And yes, exactly. Food. And we see them on Facebook or Instagram and you're like, great, they're still training. Still training. Still yeah, fun. absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely that's the so, good feeling. That's so yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's a good yeah. feeling. Yeah. Um, you have any advice you'd give the new practitioner or even new school owner? Uh, advice for well, this is what I would say for new practitioners and new uh, um, and new school owners. For so for for practitioners, number one is take your time to find a good instructor um, in whatever discipline of martial arts you want to um, try out. Right? Um, don't look. A lot of times when people are looking for like health clubs or if they want to get involved in martial arts and stuff like that, you might go to what's more convenient, right? Either it's close to your job or it's close to your home and you'll go there. But just because someone is is good at doing that martial arts doesn't mean that they're good at teaching. That's the difference, right? Someone could be, there's a, the, I've had, I've had a, the opportunity to train with a couple of people in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And honestly, unbelievable Brazilian jiu-jitsu, right? They, they would beat my butt anytime all day, right? There's no way in the world I could, I could, they're just black belts in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and they're great, but their teaching wasn't good in, in my opinion, because I've been teaching for a long time. So uh, they don't have a good teaching approach and they don't know how to teach. So I would say, take your time to find someone who's actually a good teacher. In fact, I would say they could be mediocre at actually doing the martial arts and good at teaching, right? Because um, I'm when you look for a good teacher, they have to have that passion, right? They have to have that eye. They have to have that ability to look what you 
what each individual person needs and give it to them. Because when you're teaching a class, we have so many different people in the class and not everyone in the class learns the same way. So a good instructor is able to say, okay, John, this is what John needs to hear to get him better. And this is what Tony needs to hear to get him better. And they could differentiate between those two and make sure that we both get the messages that we need in order for us to improve in our in our skills because uh, everyone is different. So take your time to find an instructor. Don't just go because it's a little bit convenient. Yeah, you know, if you're, you you want to leave work and you want to just go one block down to go to the class or you're at home and you only want to go one block down, um, I could tell you as a person who's gotten on a plane and flew all the way to LA five or six hours every single time, um, and I went back and forth from New York to 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 Boston every single week for 10 years to learn Taekwondo, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's sometimes it's not going to be convenient, but it's going to be better for you when you find an instructor that really can teach you. And also, once you get the knowledge and it's inside your brain, it's yours forever, right? You have it forever. It's something that no one can take away. Things could happen in your life. You can get your ups and your downs, but your martial arts is going to live with inside your brain and inside your body. So, uh, you know, take the time to find a good instructor and not not just rush out because it's convenient. Um for the new school owners, I would just say, don't open a school unless you're totally passionate about teaching. So everybody, I used to say that martial arts, uh, owning martial arts studios was kind of like a sleeper business. A lot of people didn't know that, yeah, it's a multi-million dollar business. Lots of people, could you can make a lot of money and take care of your family and, and have a good lifestyle from teaching martial arts. But if you do it Thinking about the money, you're not going to be a good instructor and you're not going to have a lot of students. Students are not going to come because, um, you know, they, they're, they're going to be able to tell that you're not really that interested in getting them better. You're just interested in them paying. You know, so if you have the right kind of passion and you're there to do it for the right reasons, um, the money will come. So don't think about the money. Just think about having a good studio, have, running a, a professional studio, having your studio nice and clean and, and available for people and, and make sure that you have the right the right staff uh, doing the right parts of the job. Like some people are good at, you know, talking to people. Uh, some people are good at teaching kids. Some people have a, a good attitude of teaching teens and adults. Put the right staff in the right place. Um, and then your studio will, will do fine and, and the money will come. You don't have to think about it. Just think about doing really well and the money will come after that. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. Um, yeah. I know I always tell people, I'm like, you don't get into teaching unless you you really want to teach white belts, right? right. Better, yeah. And I know so many people who don't want to teach white belts. Yeah. Right. You're going to spend the majority of your time teaching the basics. <laughs> you better be passionate about it and love right. teaching people because that's going to be the vast majority of what you're that's doing. But man, I know. I, I, I travel all the time teaching um, certifications and uh, some of my friends said, oh man, that's so cool. You know, man, you got a chance to travel. You went to Texas last week and then another week you were in LA. You were like, and I'm like, yeah, you know what I did? I was in a room for eight hours watching people do pluck from the front, choke from the front. I said, like, you know how many times I have to watch that same thing over and over and over and over again? So it's, it's not as fabulous as you might think. But I still love doing it, right? I still love making those distinctions, and and I still love teaching that white belt. I said, if I didn't love that, then then it, then there wouldn't be the job that I should be doing. So yeah, you better love doing it. And you're going to be teaching because, and and not only that, if you're gonna if you want to take if you want to take the approach of teaching like you do in your regular martial arts where you're you're competitive, compete against yourself. I'm because to me, anyone could take that real athletic kid. Let's say. You get this teenager in your school. I'm sure we've all had it. I've had a, a teenager. You showed him the move and in two tries, they got it down, right? That kid is athletic. He's he's he, he's also the champ of the baseball team. He's also the champ of the basketball team and he plays football and he's just super athletic. He got great genes from his parents and you show him a technique and within five or six um, repetitions, the kid's doing it better than you, right? Anybody can teach that kid. Right. Anyone yeah. can teach that kid. There's no there's no stretch and there's no imagination to your teaching ability to be able to teach that guy. But teach the guy who comes into your school who has to do it 30 times, 40 times before you even start to see the smallest improvement. Right. And being able to be patient enough to watch that person do it over and over and over again for six months. And then finally, after eight months, that front kick looks perfect. Right. It took eight months to get that front kick to look like something. That guy is what makes you a good teacher. But any guy could teach anybody can teach that athletic dude who comes into your school and gets it in three or four tries. That's not a yeah. that doesn't make you a great teacher. Yeah, I always like it when coaches are like, 
well, so-and-so is doing really well, or, you know, whatever they're talking about. I'm like, that guy was a college gymnast. Right. You know, called, like, he's a college soccer player. You're talking about a collegiate level athlete. I'm like, they're fantastic. Like who, like, that's great. They're good. They're right. good athletes. Easy to coach. Right. About the, the rest of the people. How about the other right, nine, right? Like the majority of your, your students are gonna have to go. Like, okay, thirty tries, forty tries, and then it's starting to look like something. You gotta yeah. look good like, because yeah, that that does. You know, anybody can teach that guy. You know, so yeah. ch- so challenge yourself to teach somebody who's gonna be really challenging and, and that's gonna keep you up late at night trying to figure out how do I get him wow. to understand that he needs to turn his hip over a little bit more when he does that round kick. Yeah. <laughs> you know? What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> right. I thought it was really interesting, uh, your comment about finding the right coach and, you know, finding a good fit because my, or one of my co- uh, high school football coaches n- never played football in high school. I think he maybe he played peewee, but he, he came from the biggest school in Massachusetts, I believe at the time, Brockton High, and he, he didn't make the team. Mm. And he had, he had a very passionate <laughs> If the team was down, passionate speech about not making the team and how lucky we were to be on this small little island and and you could get on the team and sit on the bench and get, you know, a championship jacket if we won the championship here. And, you know, and he had a very passionate speech about not making the team and wanting, but he was a fantastic coach. Just phenomenal. Like, I mean, he had championship softball teams and basketball teams and football he was just a fantastic coach. He didn't right. need to play the game and do it physically. Right, he right. He did, right. You and yeah, find if, you think about, like that. if you think about a lot of coaches, man, that were really good coaches, uh, one that comes to mind is John Wooden, uh, coaches who trained and teach, you know, taught world championship teams. And they're not as good as their players, but they have the ability to make the team work cohesively or they have the ability to understand what's needed in the team to get the team to the next level. And you know what? You don't need to be able to shoot the ball like Michael Jordan in order to teach Michael Jordan how to work with the team so that he gets the ball when they need to get the ball to him, you know? So uh, it's, you just find that person who's passionate about teaching. And if they're passionate about teaching, they're going to be good at it. And and, and even if they're physically not good at it, then maybe they didn't make their high school team. Maybe they didn't make varsity, but that doesn't say that they can't do it because I've met so many people who are phenomenal martial artists. They can't teach at all. But they can kick your butt, but they can't teach yeah. you how to kick butt. <laughs> yeah, know? that's what that's what you need. <laughs> so you need the person who's really passionate about it. And usually, um, usually what I found in my in my experience is that people who are really passionate about teaching usually become really good teachers. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up, Tony. I right, really man. appreciate you taking a taking the time to talk to me. Hopefully we can have you back on soon, or at least I see you uh, at some training soon. Yeah, man. Awesome. I really appreciate you inviting me. It was awesome. I love talking to you and definitely I'll be more than happy um, to come on and talk to you about anything that you want to talk about, man. Yeah. I think people are going to enjoy listening to you. So I will get it out to you as soon as I can. So thank you very much, Tony. All right. Thanks, John. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. All right. Take Take care care of yourself. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone. That's Tony Morrison. Krav Maga Alliance executive team member. Thank you very much for listening to the John Hallett podcast. We will talk to you all soon.